approximately 550 miles from Port Moresby. It's a long way. Too long for medium bombers and the fighter escort they require. At least the Japs think so, because for a long time it has been hit only by heavy bombers and always at night. The sons of heaven are resting easy. On a certain day in August, the 8th Photo Squadron brings in some astonishing reconnaissance pictures. This is the town of Wewak. This is Wewak Strip. This is the Boron Strip. And it is crowded with airplanes, fighters, bombers, sitting wing tip to wing tip. It's the same at Dagua. 200, perhaps 250 airplanes in all. A sudden concentration of air power. The Japs are up to something. In the house on the hill, men gather to carry on the business of war. Quick decisions must be made. The future depends on sound judgment and courage. General Whitehead, commanding general advance echelon 5th Air Force, consults with his staff. He says to them, this is the opening battle for air supremacy in central New Guinea. And the idea is to get there first. It is still dark when the pilots are briefed. The heavy bombers have not yet returned from a preliminary night strike at Wewak. Bombs are loaded. Machine guns are checked. take the pilots and crews to their airplanes. The same old routine, except that this time it has a new and historic significance. Pilots and crews consider this new adventure. They have a long ride ahead. Colonel D.P. Hall leads the third attack group. The pilots are ready, waiting. The ground crews have done their jobs. Now it's up to them. Finally, they take off. This is the road to Wewak, and these are the travelers. Mitchell medium bombers. That's right, mediums. The unexpected is about to happen. Courage born of sound judgment dares to use the weapon of surprise. Wewak is to be bombed and strafed by medium bombers. How will they get there? Let's just call it a secret weapon. Now they're moving on to their first rendezvous where they will meet the fighters. There they come. Here are the fighters, the lightning. The sons of heaven don't like them at all because they strike too hard, and usually only once. They have met now, and together they move on inexorably to their second rendezvous, Wewak. They fly at about 12,000 feet, hiding under a cover of clouds. About 15 miles from Wewak, they drop down to treetop level, picking up speed. Now they're close to the target. The third attack group leads the way in. They climb over a small ridge, and there before them are the strips of Wewak. The Japs are fast asleep in the morning sun. Fighters keep constant watch. This is 
is Dagua. And here, too, the Japs are caught on the ground. It's a matter of seconds. And the strips of Wewak and Borum are covered with a pall of black smoke rising in columns above 1,500 feet. Nearly all airplanes on aerodromes are either damaged or destroyed. Inadequately dispersed airplanes have been bombed and strafed, causing tremendous explosions and a sheet of flame 100 feet in the air. At least seven large fires. And again, nearly all airplanes believed either destroyed or damaged. The sons of heaven are wide awake now, but it's too late. Not a single Japanese airplane gets off the ground. The Japs have been caught with their planes down. And so the road back. It's a long way, 1,100 miles round trip, as far as a mission from England to Western Germany or from Africa to Northern Italy. But the weather is clear, ceiling and visibility unlimited, particularly over the target. Colonel Hall is justifiably proud of the third attack group. The ever-present Red Cross provides something to eat and a cold drink. Flyers are always hungry. Then comes interrogation by intelligence. Pilots report what they saw and did. All agree that enemy personnel seem to have been taken completely by surprise and that no enemy airplanes were airborne. Colonel Hall flies to Brisbane to make a report to the nation over NBC. He says he is convinced the Jap planes would have taken off in another 30 minutes to launch an attack against us. But, says Colonel Hall, we beat them to the punch and we pulverized them. Major Connolly, Colonel Hall's co-pilot, says, we expected to find about 75% of the jet planes in the air. We never thought we'd find them like sitting ducks. Major J.A. Downs, who led the right wing, says, as we strafed through that black column, the intense heat created an updraft that bounced our ship into the air. Planes were burning everywhere we looked. Colonel Hall's navigator, Lieutenant Don Lease, says, when we came in, some of the Japs were on a beach tossing a medicine ball around. Others were walking around on the sand in bright-colored robes. I never saw a beach crowd disappear so fast. And the commanding general advanced echelon says, Well over 50% Japanese airplanes that we walked and them were destroyed. And another 35% badly damaged. Dagua Rome suffered heavy damage. We lost two heavy bombers in a collision over the target last night. Another was forced down, but all of its crew excepting four are safe. We had no losses at all in the day operations, not even anyone hurt. The results today again prove that the way to achieve
I remember New Guinea from one end of it to the other. And the one thing I always remember, we never had enough trained troops. How come? Whose fault was that? It was nobody's fault. It's just we didn't have enough reserve outfits training and ready to go when Pearl was hit. I was up in Hawaii at the time. One of the first outfits sent to Australia, then up to New Guinea. I'll never forget those days. Water and mud were the things that dominated our lives. This was New Guinea. There were months at a time when the rain fell every day, until after a while we didn't even notice we were wet. We lived with it all day and bedded down in it at night. Yes, every time I see mud, I remember New Guinea. New Guinea is the second largest island in the world, situated directly north of Australia. By September 1942, the enemy had moved down from Buna to a distance 20 miles from Port Moresby. Our GIs were not yet in the battle, but the Australians were, moving up the famed and treacherous Kakoda Trail from Moresby over the Owen Stanley Mountains. Native carriers were a great help. The Aussies slowly pushed the enemy back over the Kokoda Trail, over terrain without roads or reason, never knowing where the enemy was concealed. The problem of supplying the Australian troops in the Owen Stanley mountain range, which ascends to 14,000 feet, was solved only by air. But there were no airstrips on which to land and unload the needed ammunition, food and medicines. The astonished natives watched the aircraft fly in low and drop supply containers in the open fields. These Australian allies had been fighting alone in New Guinea from the start. But in the fall of 1942, we began to arrive. First at Port Moresby, where we loaded into aircraft to be airlifted over the Owen Stanley to the north coast. We landed on a strip the Australians had taken from the enemy a short while before. It was here in this vicinity that the Yanks received their baptism of fire at Buna and San Ananda. Although each one of the troops fought well, we engaged the enemy with little equipment and soon discovered our training had not completely prepared us for the brutal battles which lay ahead. Sometimes we found ourselves with our backs to the sea when the tide of battle would suddenly change. Buna Village, Buna Mission, and San Ananda Point, all desperate battles fought and won by desperate troops. These first victories were secured as the new year, 1943, commenced. And we had a chance to look around at the scenery. It was downright attractive if you could concentrate on it, which you couldn't, because there were snipers everywhere. So we increased our patrol activities around the clock. Since there were no roads of any consequence along the north coast of New Guinea, and since the jungle grew in a stubborn tangle right down to the beaches, we started to leapfrog from shore to shore westward by small craft and rubber boats. We advanced slowly, hitting enemy concentrations where we found them. After losing Buna, the enemy loaded 15,000 troops into ships and headed for New Guinea and us. The Allied Air Forces spotted the convoy in the Bismarck Sea. We sank.
tank every transport, and the enemy had 15,000 less troops in our area. The Air Force was also softening up our next objective, westward from Buna, the Lae Salamawa sector. didn't have many troops in New Guinea at this time, we did have some highly specialized ones, such as the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment. The jumpers were thoroughly trained in parachute techniques. They packed and carried what they needed for combat. At the airstrip in Moresby, the parachute is loaded into aircraft for their first combat jump. The objective of the parachutists was to seize the airstrip in the Markham Valley, a few miles inland from Salamawa. A smoke screen was laid to deny the enemy observation of the drop zone. Make no mistake about the parachutes. They are only a means of transportation. The airstrip was seized by these infantrymen on the ground after the jump. The Australians were continuing their push westward along the north coast toward Lae and Salamawa. converging on Salamawa too. By September 1943, the sector was secured. In December of 43, with a few more troops, ships, and planes, we stage our biggest amphibious landing to date. We leaped up to the island of New Britain to secure our New Guinea victories. On the northeast coast of New Britain, the enemy had his largest base of the southwest Pacific, Rabul. We sealed off Rabul by taking the southwest sector of the island at Arawi and Cape Gloucester. It took us a year to advance 240 miles north from Buna. I'd left 2,240 miles of island hopping before we reached Manila. At the rate we were going, it'd take us about 10 years before we reached the capital of the Philippines. We didn't have enough trained troops to go any faster. That's why the United States was lucky to have time to train more troops. You know, I'm beginning to see what you mean when you say it, it is important to have trained troops ready for action when they're needed. That's right. But remember this, the few battles we had won in New Guinea by the end of 1943 were all actually won by the infantry, that ultimate weapon. Of course, the Air Force and the Navy did a great job, that's for sure. But it was always the man with the rifle that went in, took over and secured the area. Well, by 1944, troops began arriving in New Guinea, trained, equipped and ready to go. But these same troops were either green or non-existent two years before Pearl Harbor was hit. But by the beginning of 1944, they began arriving in the staging areas of New Guinea. I bet they looked pretty good. They sure did. Ah, well, things are beginning to look a lot better all around. But well, we weren't kidding ourselves. We still face the toughest enemy stronghold in New Guinea. Ered, we whack and Madang. Fully garrisoned, armed with the teeth and waiting for us. But the 
brass had no intention of hitting the big enemy concentration head on. The new strategy devised a, a whole new concept of island fighting. We call it hit them where they ain't. It all started when we leapfrogged up to the Admiralty Islands. Now this is the way it works. First the Air Corps clobbered the enemy airstrip on Los Negros, a small island in the Admiralties. The Admiralties is composed of the large island of Manus and many smaller islands, such as Los Negros. We needed the Admiralties to deny the enemy air bases from which to strike at our advance westward along the coast of New Guinea. But we couldn't be certain of the enemy's strength. So before the decision was made to invade Los Negros, we flew in a squad of Alamo scouts to reconnoiter and report back. These specially trained troops landed, looked around and returned to New Guinea unobserved by the enemy. The disposition of the enemy was reported as unorganized and inadequately prepared. The Air Force and Navy were sent in to soften up Los Negros for invasion. A reconnaissance in force was convoyed to the Admiralties. This reinforced battalion went ashore to seize the Los Negros airstrip, with the commander-in-chief on hand to observe the operation. With the airstrip in our possession, we advanced our own air bases to extend our bomber range and to provide fighter cover for further operations. But the battle wasn't over yet. More troops and artillery were needed to overcome the enemy resistance. The success in the Admiralties created new opportunities. The Supreme Commanders, General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, met to plan new strategy. It was decided not to invade Wewak and Madang. Instead, we would leapfrog 800 miles to Itapi in a Hollandia, bypassing the enemy strongholds. We kept the enemy guessing about our next move as we continued airstrikes against all of those bases. the big prize with three enemy airstrips. By April 1944, we were ready for Itapi and Hollandia. During an early morning in April 1944, we invaded Itapi. At the same time Itapi was invaded, we hit Hollandia from two sides, Tamahamara Bay and Humboldt Bay. Both approaches led inland to Lake Centene, where the airstrips lay. Starting from the landing beaches, the terrain rose steeply, and the loose, wet underfooting made the ascent hazardous. Somehow we managed to get our Amtraks up and inland to the lake. 
These armed water taxis were a welcome sight after climbing the jungle-encrusted slopes up to the lake. And we rode for a change to the enemy positions. But what small pockets of resistance we did find were quickly overcome. The rest of the enemy fled to the hills. We surveyed our prize, the three airstrips, littered with enemy aircraft which would never again attack us. This Hollandia operation was a classic example of the new strategy. Bypass the enemy strongholds and hit them where they ain't. We had bypassed the huge enemy naval, air and army bases at Wewak and Madang. We kept moving fast. We leapfrogged up to Arara then secured a small island offshore and placed our artillery and commenced firing at Wakdi Island. Wakdi is a small island and after the relatively easy success of Hollandia, we half expected a push over here, but we were wrong. There was no room to maneuver. We hugged the narrow strip of beach, but the enemy dug in solid coral, fortified and looking down our throats. Yes, again, our objective was another airstrip, to deny the enemy its use and to provide our air force with an advanced base from which to extend our bomber and fighter range. Even before the fighting was over, our combat engineers were getting the strip in shape for our fighter aircraft. Twelve days after we hit Wakdi, another task force hit Biak, a larger and more strongly fortified island. the troops hitting the beaches at Biak, many were now veterans of amphibious warfare, but many more were getting their first combat experience. The Biak campaign was to become one of the most difficult in the battle for New Guinea. For the airdromes on Biak, we had paid a heavy price. It was a necessary price. But nevertheless, we were sobered by the number of gallant Americans we had to leave behind. Wherever we were, there was also our ever-present companion, Rain, keeping us in a wet and soggy embrace. From a staging area at Moffin Bay, another task force started out for Sanzapore on the westernmost tip of New Guinea. Preceding the landing, the Air Force and Navy worked the area over. Sanzapore turned out to be one of those unexpected surprises. We were prepared for a rugged fight, but the enemy, what there was left of them, just melted away into the jungle, and we grabbed the airstrip without too much trouble. So here we were at Sanzapore. We had sealed up New Guinea trapping an estimated 150,000 enemy troops with no chance of escape. They could either surrender or starve. New Guinea was ours.
We took Sanzapur two years and eight months after Pearl Harbor. By that time, more troops, trained, equipped, many of them combat veterans, were available and loaded for the next big operation, Leyte in the Philippines. And that's the way it went. The I Today We Wag campaign was one of the final campaigns of the Pacific Theater of World War II. Between November 1944 and the end of the war in August 1945, the Australian 6th Division, with air and naval support, fought the Imperial Japanese 18th Army in northern New Guinea, considered a mopping up operation by the Australians, and although ultimately successful for them with the Japanese forces cleared from the coastal areas and driven inland, amidst difficult jungle conditions, casual from combat and disease were high, with Japan on the verge of defeat. Such casualties later led to the strategic necessity of the campaign being called into question. Background in 1942, the Japanese occupied the Itape region in northern New Guinea as part of the general advance south. On the 22nd of April 1944, however, United States Army forces, primarily the 163rd Regimental Combat Team from the 41st Infantry Division, landed and recaptured the area in order to help secure the flank of U.S. forces fighting around Hollandia. Following this, Itape was developed as base from which to support the continuing Allied drive towards the Philippines under U.S. forces in the area swelled to include elements of the 31st and 32nd Infantry Division. Largely these forces stayed inside a small defensive area around the airfield and apart from the Battle of Drinamore River in July. Fighting was limited, as preparations began for this drive. It was decided that defense of the area would be passed to Australian forces in order to release the American troops for service elsewhere. Consequently, in early October 1944, troops from the Australian 6th Division along with some support personnel from the 3rd Base sub-area began to arrive at Itape to relieve the American garrison. The first unit to arrive was the 2, 6th Cavalry Commando Regiment and they began patrolling operations almost immediately. The Japanese troops in Itape consisted of approximately 30,000 to 35,000 men from the Japanese 18th Army. This force had suffered heavily during the Salimane campaign in 1943-44, as well as its failed attack on the American and garrison at Itape in July 1944. 